Welcome to Living Web Farms. I'm Pat Battle, I'm the director, and I'm the instructor today, too. Anyways, I've been growing root crops for 38 years, with varying degrees of success. <laughs> um, every year I have some successes, I have some failures. But I'll try and share what I know with you, and I'll share a little bit of excitement about some unusual ones, too, some fun ones that you probably, or possibly haven't heard of, maybe you have. There are three families that are just loaded with roots. Apaceae, which used to be Umbellifera. Carrots, pretty widely known. Celeriac, how many, does everybody know celeriac? Celeriac is the root of celery. It's developed for the root, just like, you know, chard, the beet was developed, you know, for the root. Um, and it's a pretty special root, it's really fun. Um, parsnips, how many people like parsnips? All right. All right, great. Parsley root. Any familiarity with parsley root? I'm not surprised. Um, I would say, you know, when you're really ahead of the game and adventurous, try parsley root. It's not the most, like, you know, got to have it vegetable. But it's interesting. Skirret. Skirret. Anybody know skirret? I didn't think you would. Neither do I. I've never grown it, but as I was researching this, I'm going to have to grow it. Because actually, it totally fits into where I am as a grower. We just developed 30 some acres of swales and berms and ponds. And we have to plant all that area to take advantage of the incredible water um, storing capacity of the swales and the fertility of the um, swales and then the, the wonderful growing conditions of the berms, which are gonna be up so they have good drainage, but also gonna have all the water they ever want. Skirret likes to grow along wet edges. It's mostly a, med a medieval thing. Um, supposedly, I think it's supposedly somewhat similar to parsnip in taste, but kind of mushy. And it makes masses of finger thick roots. What's really cool about it is it's a perennial. So it's just there. And the longer it's there, the bigger the roots. Eventually the older roots will get tough, but they'll be always roots to pick. So you can pick it year round and you can propagate it from little rooted pieces that come off the side. So it sounds pretty exciting. I've been reading about it in the catalog for years and thought, yeah, I should try that medieval vegetable. But it's as big as my little finger. I don't want to deal with that, you know, and wash all these little things. No, but if it can be a perennial and then a food source for when you're in the mood for that flavor or whatever, it might be pretty fun. Cilantro root. Anybody ever heard of cilantro root? It's not in the books. It's nowhere except in my favorite Thai cookbook. And we make a green curry sauce that calls for, among other things, blended up liquefied bay leaves. We happen to have a bay tree. And the entire plant, including the root of cilantro. It's actually very good. Um, so I just threw it in there because that's why the quotation marks are on it. It's not te technically a root crop, and yet it's a root that we can eat. And that happens a few times as, we, as we're talking today. I'll mention a few other things that are like that. Okay. The Asteraceae is basically the composite, is what it used to be called, you know, sunflower family. And Jerusalem artichokes, burdock. Burdock kind of surprises me because I don't look at the flower. It doesn't look like a composite to me, but it's a composite. Yacone, salsify, scorzonera, scorzona, zonera. I don't, I haven't grown that one, and I can't pronounce it. <laughs> um, but... It's supposedly very similar to salsify, which I have grown, and I like quite a bit. Though salsify's other name is oyster root, and that's, in my experience, a stretch. You know, it doesn't taste like oyster to me. Chicory, chicory, some people actually eat the roots. What we more commonly use it for is a coffee substitute, you know, or a coffee adjunct. And then dandelion, once again, that's, the roots can be eaten, but more often people roast them and use them for a coffee-like drink. And then the Brassiaceae, ACA, um, turnips, radishes, rutabagas, horseradish. You know, these are the, the families that have loads of roots that we eat in them. You know, lots of roots. They're the big, the big players. Chenopodaceae is beets. That's the only root that we tend to eat from that. There's, there's a, a category of beets called mangles. I tend not to separate them out. They're more often grown for... Um, livestock feed, but they can be eaten. 
and sometimes they're very nice. And there's some breeding, people are breeding them in with the beets and getting bigger beets that way and stuff too. And then Convolvulaceae, Convolvulaceae, that's the morning glory family, and that's sweet potatoes. And then Solanacea, Irish potatoes. I almost left those out, by the way, because they're actually not a root. They're a bulb. And not a bulb, really, it's a swollen stem, a swollen stem that stores energy for, the, for seed production. And I almost left them out because there's a ton of things I'm trying to cover, and I figure most everybody... How many people here have questions about growing potatoes? Okay, we've got a couple. We'll cover them, you know. But most of us have a pretty good idea how to grow potatoes, you know. I might talk a little about some varieties, a few tricks. The most fun thing I'll talk about is if you get fruit, save the seed and grow it. That's pretty, pretty exciting. And then finally, the incidentals, and I didn't even mention all of them, but I mentioned a few of the ones that really stand out for me. Oka, I've grown, it's pretty fascinating. It's in the same family as oxalis, or what we used to call sour grass as a kid. So it's got a tuber, not real big, they're about like that big at the biggest. And um, I thought it was like, well, I don't know how many of these are gonna grow because they're high in oxalic acid. Does everybody know what about oxalic acid? Okay, no questions about that. Um, so, I don't know what it is. Okay, oxalic acid is in things like rhubarb, it's in spinach, it's in chard. Some people can't stand to eat it because it's just so sharp. And what is not good about it and why rhubarb leaves are poisonous because there's so much oxalic, oxalic acid in it is that it blocks the absorption of calcium and other minerals. What did you say was poisonous? Rhubarb leaves. Oh. Not the, not the stems, but the leaves, you know? Um, and so, who needs more oxalic acid? But it turns out, and a little bit is kind of interesting, we like rhubarbs, and so I could see having a tuber that was both kind of starchy and also had um, a tart flavor being an interesting thing to use in maybe curries or something like that, you know? Or, lo and behold, Peruvian food, because it is Andean. Um, but, What's fun is, I, in getting ready for this class, I learned that in Bolivia, they've, de they've also de developed a whole bunch that are not high in oxalic acid. And that's real exciting. Mashua is a close relative of nasturtiums. It's a vining, you know, it doesn't, vi it vines like nasturtiums, but it, it actually vines better, it winds more, so it actually grows up better than nasturtiums. And it has the same kind of flowers, same kind of leaves, same kind of flavor. And it's about, that big, and it's got all these neat little grooves in it. It's kind of pretty. And it's pretty interesting. And then Chinese artichoke, also in France known as grasny, um, it's in the mint family. And it's kind of a perennial. You can never get them all out and they come back every year. They're not very big and they have a similar kind of like little lines around it. Those are the ones that I have some familiarity with and more or less, I've grown all of them. And the one, the two that I haven't grown are groundnut, and I actually had a bag one time and I didn't get them in the ground. Yeah. And once again, when I read about it now, it's like, why in the world didn't I get it in the ground? Because it's a perennial. It's in the um, bean family, Fabaceae, and therefore the tuber is high in protein, which is not a common thing. Potatoes have some protein, but this, the um, ground nut has 10 times as much. So it's a perennial, long running um, runner, so it spreads. Um, and a lot of these, well, the, the, um, for sure the ground nut anyways, can take a fair amount of um, moisture. And once again, the first year they won't be very big, the next year they'll be bigger eventually if they stay in the ground long enough, they're probably not gonna be that good to eat, but they can have a couple of years of getting bigger. The idea of having Root crops that are unautomatic, that are always there, is pretty appealing, you know, and totally plays into the resiliency mission that we have. You know, I mean, if things got hard, I'd probably be quite happy to clean every one of those skirt roots very carefully and relish them, you know. Um, and then, I don't know anything about this, but I love the family that it's in, which is Malabar spinach. And I hope I'm saying that right. That's Ulico or Ulico, um, and it is a tuber. How many people know Malabar spinach? Okay, for you, those of you that don't know Malabar spinach, it's a tropical, our southern hemisphere, 
vine, vine that has big, succulent, um, mild tasting leaves. They are somewhat slimy, not as nearly as slimy as okra, but they are a little slimy, or mucilaginous, I guess I should say. But they work really nice with other greens. So if you get something like amaranth, which is kind of dry, and put about 10 or 15% uh, Malabar spinach in it, it's pretty, pretty good. It makes this Malabar seem way more succulent. The fun thing about the Ulico or Ulico um, is that it has edible leaves too. So you kind of get your Malabar spinach and your tuber, yeah. We've uh, had something that I only know as narrow dock and it grows wild and uh, it's got long leaves. It doesn't take very long to cook, but it's mucilaginous and it has a sour taste. And what's the name of it again? Narrow dock. Oh, narrow dock. So is it a dock? Do, I don't know. Docks have kind of tart leaves and bitter. Yeah, tart leaves. And the, um, the flowers are kind of nondescript, like a whole mass along the top. Yeah, and then it cooks down to nothing. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, and I just heard there was another, somebody else had another name for that, too. It's another dock, and I think it might even be out there. Once somebody was just telling me about it, is the leaves weren't as bitter, too. Um, I started noticing it, you know. So that's actually in the Rumex family, same family as um, rhubarb, okay. you know. And so hence, that's the oxalic acid, which is why you're getting that tart flavor, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, there's loads of other roots that are edible, but these are ones that people have bothered to cultivate somewhere, and they're a significant part of people's diets in some places. So the pluses to growing root crops, the big one is massively productive. I like history, and so one year my partner gave me a history magazine, and the cover was of peasants mounding up mountains of rutabagas. Before there were potatoes, rutabagas and parsnips and turnips were like huge important food sources for the poor. Because you got you know, small amounts of land, you get huge amounts of food from them, and it's usually pretty high calorie, and a fair amount of nutrients. Not usually a lot of protein, but a fair amount of minerals, and vitamins and stuff like that, and it stores, you know. So that's pretty major for, for once the potato happened, so much more productive. All those other roots kind of went by the wayside. It's not like they didn't grow them, but not nearly as much, you know. They needed calories. They were trying to stay alive, you know, so they went for the thing that had the most calories. Root crops are often nutrient dense. There's a lot of minerals in them, you know, a lot of food value, um, vitamins, okay. Many lend themselves to mechanical harvest or one-time digging. So they're not, you don't have to be out there harvesting like tomatoes, beans, things like that. They're just like an endless job, you know. And sometimes that's hard to get done. You have so many things going on. You get the potatoes in the ground, you hoe them a couple times, you know. Maybe you pick some bean beetles off. Keep them watered, harvest tons of food. Get the, get the parsnips up, get them mulched or somehow get the weeds off them, come back and pick them, you know. True for all kinds of root crops. They really don't take that much work besides establishment, you know. Provide both farmers and home gardeners produce, not supposed to say lean, but it changed itself, um, during the lean and off-season times because of their superior keeping qualities. So you get, get them grown and then store them right. And the good news is in our kind of climate, the ideal temperature for keeping a lot of these roots is someplace well below 40. And if you don't bury them too deep in the wintertime around here, you're going to get someplace well below 40. And you're burying on the ground, the humidity is probably going to be pretty high. I mean, I've stored potatoes and had them come out where I cut them and they squeak like new potatoes. You know, way better than anything that's in the fridge. But they were near freezing all the time. And that is the ideal temperature for storing all these roots and loads of other vegetables, 32 degrees, technically freezing but barely freezing with all the sugars and stuff in there. They don't actually freeze, but they're just on the edge, you know? And 90 some percent humidity. That's like the ideal storage temperature of things. With a few notable exceptions, such as carrots, parsnip, beets, they, they rely on asexual reproduction, which means the upside, there's actually a, a downside I'll talk about in a minute. The upside is that if you're trying to save crop that you can, re you can reproduce, you can count on it being true and good. So you get yourself a really productive potato, you save it, it's always going to be a really productive potato. Unless it gets viruses or things like that that run it down, but genetically it's not going to change. It's a clone. 
and most root, root crops, or the great majority of them, are reproduced through cloning. So you get lots of value. It's kind of fun when they produce the other way, though, because then suddenly there's a world of possibility. You know, there's not much possibility. You know your Yukon gold is always going to be the same. It crosses with a purple potato. Now that's going to be something interesting. You know, may not be very good, but it'll be interesting. By nature, most, this is the negative sides, the minuses. And the number one is voles. How many people have problems with voles with their root crops? And what are your soils like? Are they pretty good soils? Clay. Pardon? Yeah, you dig down enough to get into clay. Yeah, but where the roots are growing is higher up. It's nice, right? Yeah. yeah. That's the paradox. You need good, loose soil to grow roots really well, right? They like loose soil. They don't want to have to work to, they don't put their energy into driving through the clay. They want to put their energy into making roots, right? The problem is if you have good, loose soil, the voles don't have to work too hard and they tear your crops up. We cannot grow sweet potatoes out in this garden anymore because we've improved the soil so well that when we dig the sweet potatoes, they're huge because the soil's so good, but all we see is the bottom skin and a nub. You know? <laughs> Seventy some percent of the crop lost last time we grew it here. So we moved, and you'll see a picture, to a very heavy clay field. And the first year we grew there and the second year we grew there, the guys all complained. They said, I don't see how these potatoes can grow here. It hurts my hand to even work it in here. Because the clay, how clay is when it's been wet, and then you plow it open, big clumps and stuff. That's what it was like, you know. Hardly ever a vole, Nick even. The voles don't want to work that hard, you know, so you protect them that way. Okay. Um, another negative is that the nature of growing roots, except for with those perennials that we were talking about, is that you usually have to do a fair amount of soil disturbance. And that's, I mean, if you're rotating, you can still be doing a lot of less tillage other times a year. And you only have to create that where you're planting, so it's not that much disturbance. But where it really becomes a negative is when you want to harvest. If you try, like, and actually, this is the perfect example. Everybody remember last fall? You know, you need a gas mask to walk outside. I remember breaking into a wicked sweat after two minutes of work one October afternoon because it was like in the 90s, you know. No rain. Well, we grew our sweet potatoes in that clay field. Sure got the voles fooled, didn't we? We have a 60 horsepower tractor and a potato plow, and I stood on it to try and get the plow to go in the ground. We couldn't get the sweet potatoes out because we didn't have enough water to water it. We, they were literally locked in there. They would not come out. And it didn't start raining until after it had froze so hard that, I mean, we did dig you know, a half a row and got some sweet potatoes. We couldn't, like it only made where, it, like usually it pops it open and then you can kind of pull it on the sides and get more out because you don't get it perfect the first time. We only got the ones we hit. Everything else was still locked in. And any we saw that tried to dig out, it was like picks, you know, <laughs> trying to get it out. So that's the negative if the weather's uncooperative. And the opposite could be that it rains so much that you can't get a tractor out there. Or if you're digging, you know, you're wrecking your soil. And you might do that, like with the sweet potatoes, before, fraught, before deep cold, which kind of ruins them. But you're not going to like it, you know. So that's a negative about root crops because you're totally soil dependent. Tomatoes, all you need is a bit of sun. You can get out there and pick them, you know. But you can't do that with root crops. Largely because they're slow starters, especially things like beets and carrots and parsnips, they can really be ruined by weed pressure. You have way less slack than you do with something like a tomato which can kind of jump ahead and race up. And you can come back and say sorry and put some mulch on it later and stuff. You don't get to say sorry to carrots that are covered up in weeds. You just lose them. You can't even find them. You don't get a crop. You know? um, the challenges of sexual reproduction, trying to get potatoes to, to make fruit, trying to get um, Jerusalem artichokes to fruit reliably and stuff, which you have to have the fl flowers right in order to do breeding. You basically can't do that grassroots kind of backyard and farmer breeding because you don't have the reproductive parts you need. It's they're, they're basically relying on clones. So that's another negative. Um, and finally, yeah, you get tons and tons of food from these things. You better put a whole lot of biomass back in the ground because otherwise you're going to be running your soil down. They actually take a fair amount out in biomass. A lot of them are pretty light feeders, actually. I mean, it makes sense. 
<coughs> you don't want to feed them too much because then they're, they're going to put top growth on. You know, they're, if they're root crops, they're more about storing and, and being efficient. You know, the biomass problem. The best solution I've seen to it is in Haiti. I spent two weeks in Haiti, and I saw what a lot of people probably read about: a whole lot of NGOs not getting much done, um, not improving things very much. But there was one NGO called Soil. And actually, after one of those events where people were donating to Haiti, I looked at a list of NGOs that people were recommending, and Soil was one of them. And I was like, yes, I couldn't agree more. They, two women from the Midwest, started it. And basically, they are composting human manure in Haiti. And they're doing it perfectly right. I mean, it would just drive the health department crazy here. But they're doing it completely right. They get hot piles. They monitor the temperature. You can't walk in and out of there with walking, without walking through a, chlor a chlorine bath. So there's no possibility of taking pathogens out. You know, they, they get it to totally heat to the right temperatures and then turn it. And I saw their tests. I've run commercial compost sites, so I know what the, how to look at the tests. Their tests were perfect. They had no pathogens. The pathogen levels were lower than we allow in the United States for compost. And really high quality compost. They have a huge resource in that sugarcane is a crop for rum, which is an export and all that. And the waste product from that bagasse looks like wood, acts like wood in the compost pile, but rots away, which is perfect. You get all of the aeration, which a compost needs. But when you're done, you don't have all this wood left over to tie up the nitrogen. So they do have that advantage. And they do it all by hand. They started out with bobcats, but they realized everybody needed work. The bobcats were expensive. They couldn't afford the equipment. And the people in Haiti want it to work, so it's all done by hand. Um, very impressive. It's a future that has to happen here. And literally, it might seem off topic, but if you think about the biomass problem and you think about resilience, should we reach a point where we can't get endless input, for inputs? I can't go to Earth Fair and get all their food waste. I can't go to the co-op and get all their food waste. People don't have horses. They probably ate the horses, right? Whatever, right? What's going to be our resource that we can't afford to waste? It's going to be human manure. You know? So we, have, we need to begin to learn how to deal with it. And indeed, I say this all the time. I feel like it's my job to say it. Peak oil may be a possibility. Peak phosphorus is a certainty. Nobody knows exactly when, but they're not making any more of that one. It's not nearly as abundant as oil. And the way we do most of our agriculture and other things it ends up in our waterways, ends up in the ocean, and yeah, millions of years or billions of years from now, somebody will get to mine that phosphorus back out again. It's not leaving the planet, but it's not going to be available to us. You know? So what's, what's there a lot of in manure? Phosphorus. You know, so we should really be thinking about that. The point of the compost is that that's probably the best way to improve your soil in conjunction with Cover crops, multi-species cover crops, ideally. Really the perfect nutrition package for roots, which don't want this great big nitrogen hit, right? Actually, the longer I grow, the more I learn that really if we're trying to avoid disease and insect pressure, not much of any plants want that great big nitrogen hit, you know? Yeah? Um, I actually have a quite a bit of horse manure. So what I've done in my back of the property pile um, is turn it occasionally and in a year or two it looks exactly like that. That's what I'm using instead of compost. Is there any kind of problem with using just aged horse manure? No, that is compost. You know? um, and if you don't turn it much and stuff, at first it's probably pretty bad. But as it sits, nature fix it. you know, fixes it. So it's, it's bad at first, but the longer it sits, the better and better it gets. The stuff I'm using is like two years old. Yeah, two years old, and it's under trees probably, yeah. in the shade, not getting cooked. Yeah, it's probably darn good stuff. You could send it in and get it tested, you know. Um, it's about four bucks, you know. And if you get it tested and don't understand it, you could Skype into our show, send an email. Like, you can easily send, they make it so you can send the results on to other people. You could even put me on as a consultant. We could talk about it on the radio show, you know, and tell you what it looks like, tell you what we think about it. You know, yeah. That's the soil that we were grown. The roots that we've grown out there included sweet potatoes, potatoes, rutabagas, turnips, radishes, and parsnips. The one that did terrible, 
Anybody got a guess? Parsnips. Yeah. The carrot family really wants to not have to work so hard. You know? um, they also went in kind of on the edge as far as, in fact, all the books say they went in way too late. But I learned a long time ago in this climate that I could actually get them in in late July, use row cover to keep them going through the cold of winter, and by springtime, I have big, fat roots that are so sweet. They have a core in them because as the days start to get longer, they're beginning to go to seed. And so I got to cut the core out, but I don't really care. You know? And so I was doing that. I, lots of times parsnips are like, how many people are going to eat them at the food, at the food banks? I don't, don't think it's going to be a real popular one. You know? And so the motivation is only to grow them for us, and only a few people here like them. So I don't get them in, but I love them. And so I finally got them in. But it was in that soil. They went in late. They didn't do too good. You know, they, they, a lot of them were like that deep and about that far around, you know. Um, you know more like beets than parsnips, you know. Um, but that's the soil. And you could see that the voles probably would not like that very much, you know. Um, and that was very hard to get stuff out of. The other solution to voles, vibrant biodiversity. I don't know how well you can see that picture. That's a vole's head right there. And um, I, got this, I got this picture from the um, Creative Commons, and it got the best picture award from, for the United States and Germany. And it's a great picture. If you, I encourage you to go online and look it up. It's really inspired. You see that vole head, and it's like, oh, yeah, gee, that's tough. You, know? <laughs> you, you, know. you can dig the vole out of the ground, and then they come up. Somewhere. They come up. Yeah, they, they're up quite a bit, actually. Yeah. Um, they don't really dig that much themselves. They, they have kind of furrows they run through. They make little runways, but they use mole, mole, mole runs a whole lot. That's the problem with moles. Moles aren't really a problem for us. They feed on earthworms, but there's plenty of earthworms, and they feed on lots of things that are not beneficial to our plants. They're carnivores. The big problem is they make those runs that the voles get to use. You know? Yeah. Are they like chipmunks? Chipmunks are really terrible. The longer I've been a gardener, the more chipmunks drive me nuts. <laughs> you know, they're cute as can be, but boy, they're not friendly in the garden. Yeah. By sight, what's the? How can you tell the difference between the mole and the mole? What? The, oh, the, the moles have those blind things in the paddles, and right, you know, right. and the voles look like mice. Oh. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Have you uh, ever heard about juicy fruit gum? I have. You know, I used to do the radio. I don't know if anybody else knows. I used to do this talk radio talk show on WCQS for about 13 years. And the one thing we talked about every week was voles. <laughs> and I heard the juicy food gum thing a million times. I tried it once. I didn't get much, much impact. Well, I grew celery. And yeah. I had it uh, on paper. Mm -hmm. And I had 64 of them. Mm -hmm. when, and I've had voles for 10 years, ever mm -hmm. since I've been there. The better your soil, the more you have them, yeah. And they're, they're, my soil is great, but yeah. the, um, they, um, Started to pull the celery. Yeah, I know. That's, I've seen that. Yeah. Anybody else so, seen that? So when it's I like got, a cartoon. When I got <laughs> to, <laughs> I had three of them go down, and I said, "This is it. I cannot take it." And this person told me about juicy fruit gum. So the fourth one went down, and then I took a piece of juicy fruit, chewed it, and stuck it in the hole. I got to number fourteen, and nothing was happening. I was just like. This is sucks, you know? <laughs> and all of a sudden, everything stopped. And I have, hard, I have hardly <laughs> seen any vole damage since probably mid July. Okay, well, I got to tell you something. I always put it in without chewing it. Oh, Maybe the chewing it's the key part, you know? Yeah, well, I it just made it so that I, it would roll down their hole, you know? Uh huh. Well, that might be what made it work, because I've tried sticking the sticks in, and yeah. I, I unwrapped them, of course. I didn't expect them to unwrap them, but you know. <laughs> but this is what I want to see, you know? Is there any kind of underground fencing or something like that that can help them? Because mm -hmm. they'll just come out yeah, of the ground and jump back in again. Yeah. <laughs> they have no problem being above ground, you know? What about those sonic <laughs> things? I've seen, like, advertised those sonic stakes that get okay. in the ground. And they, you know. My favorite story about this one, right? I've actually used the, the sonic things, the cheap ones, actually. Yeah. My partner bought an $80 one and watched the mice dam d dancing on it in her studio one time. <laughs> you know? But I bought the cheap ones, and they actually tend to keep the mice away from the seedlings. 
They have to, they can't have anything blocking them. The sound has to go straight to them, right? But my friend Yana Fishman, who, she walks on her beds on purpose because she wants them to be as dense as possible. She's got so many voles. She trapped them one time, she got 40, you know? Um, she called up Peaceful Valley Farm Supply in California and said, to explain it, and she's a very serious homesteader. I mean, she grows now like a hundred and some varieties of sweet potatoes, 900 pounds a year, you know, which her family eats, you know. I mean, now her son's gone, so maybe not, but you know, serious homesteader, and it really matters to her that she gets her production, right? So she called up and she got that across to the salespeople, and she said, does this work? And they said, just a minute. And they went and conferred, they came back and said, if you're counting on this for a food supply, we wouldn't recommend buying it. You know, the little ones, I don't think the little ones aren't going to work for voles. It had to be something stronger, you know. The little ones tend to work pretty good in the greenhouse, well, you know. isn't that a plug-in? Yeah, that's a plug-in, yeah. And so... There are plug-in ones that people put out in the yards, and there are ones that are battery-powered, and there's and so things that get the blow in the wind and make noise, and, you know. They plug them in out in their yard somewhere? I, I have battery powers. I, I haven't followed them closely, but there are powered ones that send out, you know, sound waves that are supposed to make them unha unhappy. But. There's H hardware sells like $17 a piece, 3D cell batteries or C mm -hmm. cell batteries. Uh -huh. Punch hole and put it down. I uh, covers 30 yard diameter. Uh -huh. So I put five out of my garden and that stopped them all. They were mm -hmm. digging right into it. And now, it, in fact, now the first couple of weeks it will actually attract them. And they realize that noise isn't going away and they're clear out. Really? And okay. Get our garden under control. Uh huh. Well, see. Two, two things I poo-pooed and two people say it works. <laughs> you know, right. Try everything and anything. That's what, I, that's what I have to say. We have a dog that I swear sniffs the ground and finds bowls and, and digs them up. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of dogs for that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've watched our now dead wonderful lab mix stop and point. I had no idea she had any pointer in her, right? And then in this wonderful sunlight, leap and dive nose first into the ground soil flying up in the air with the sunlight coming through it and coming up with a vole in her mouth it was like is this the goddess or what <laughs> it was just this perfect organism doing this perfect job you know we also i actually now she's she's actually probably in hospice at the moment but our little dog a miniature jack russell i named her xena the warrior princess I spent 300 bucks on her to be a varmint dog. And she actually was very good at rats. She kept rats out of the wood pile, drove them nuts. It's mostly the drive them nuts factor. Because she can't get to them, she just barks all day long. <laughs> they decide they can't live there anymore, kind of like you were saying, you know. But did she get many voles? I purposely got a little one so she wouldn't tear the garden up as much. Because when I worked at the Highland Lake Inn, they had a big Jack Russell. And about twice a year, I'd come out to the garden someplace and be heartbroken because there'd be like a five square foot area totally destroyed. But after that, no voles for about five months. You know, it's just like, did you see what that guy did over there? I'm going somewhere else, you know. <laughs> you know? But um, Zena, the farm where I needed her to really do it, was full of rabbits and she spent the whole day chasing rabbits in the multiflora. You know, coming home with thorns in her, red eyes, filthy as could be, no voles, you know. I've been picking strawberries, had a rabbit running right at me, and then realizing, oops, I gotta go the other way. <laughs> being chased, you know. Um, so she wasn't very good for it. Yeah. Are there any crops that you could use to, like, abort or to discourage? Yeah, there's two. Gopher purge, which actually Richard McDonald said works pretty well, and I haven't tried it yet. Or castor bean, which of course is deadly poisonous, you know. But both of those voles don't want to go anywhere near them. So if you ring your garden with that, that'll probably do it too. Castor, castor bean plant, yeah, yeah, which is a lovely plant and deadly poisonous, you know. Um, anyway, I still like the idea of this, and about two years ago or three years ago, we had a workshop, a quickie in the evening, about making raptor houses and bat houses, and nobody came. I'm encouraging you all to come to one. If you tell me, if enough people, if I get... Five to ten people telling me they'll come for sure, we'll schedule it again this time. Not just how to make the houses, but how to do everything you can to attract the raptors, because this is the ultimate solution. You know, this is the way it's supposed to work. Those guys, tear them, and we do have a fair amount of hawk activity, activity out here, but we could have more. We don't have, you can make 
sparrowhawk houses. You can make screech owl houses. You can make bat houses. You know, bats actually aren't going to do much for the voles. They'll take care of the insects, but you know, because we can get some of those vampire bats up here. You know? <laughs> but anyway, that's anyway. The the idea of this was to say you either have heavy soil or vibrant biodiversity. Okay, so heavy soil, right? It's kind of a problem nowadays if you're like going with the main trend in gardening, which is to get away from tillage. How do you prepare your soil for root crops like carrots, which they just don't want to grow in solid, heavy soil? Our solution has been to grow plants that work with soil for us. And this was a greenhouse that, because of a mistake made by the people who built it, had loads of heavy machinery fixing the mistake. And so it was incredibly compacted. And we did a few things. We brought in a lot of compost, like two-thirds of a yard per 70, by 30, 70 foot long by 30 inch wide bed that had 5% biochar in it. So that probably helped, right? But it's still, and we actually mixed that with pond muck um, and with a native soil, which was very, very bad soil, real sandy um, subsoil. And we mixed that together to make the beds, but still it was really hard below that. So that was pretty good soil above and actually had a really high cation exchange capacity. It was good soil. But below, which is where the roots need to go, hard pan. We grew oilseed radish, rye, and a plant called Facilia tanacetifolia. And all three of those big, strong, deep roots. The Facilia is in the same family as comfrey. You know what those roots are like? Okay, and so they're, the Facilia is also a bioaccumulator. So it's like bringing up minerals for us, making the soil better, but real importantly, opening it up. And by doing that, we didn't miss a beat. You know, we, we didn't immediately start growing things. The greenhouse was ready. The beds were ready in January. We got the cover crop on there. We let it go to maturity in June. Then we started growing. Production has never been bad. It's always been great. And root crops do great in there. Carrots do great. You know, never tilled it. Never worked it at all. You know, didn't touch that compacted soil with anything but plant roots. Anybody ever seen an oil seed radish? They can get bigger than my arm. And they can get longer than my arm. What was that? Oil seed radish. It's like a big daikon, you know? And so that grows down and then it rots. Now there's holes there. Things fall in. That stuff falls in loosely. That's how you get the soil worked up without tilling it. And get it prepared for root crops, which we grow in that greenhouse all the time. And by the way, if you're hungry, speaking of root crops, you can eat that oil seed radish. I don't see it, to, I don't experience it to be a whole lot less quality than any daikon. You know, I mean, you don't want to eat it when it's going to flower, but you know, before that, you could eat it. Paramagnetic rock. Anybody ever hear of paramagnetic rock? Okay, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, I once had it explained to me by this very knowledgeable man at a conference, and I understood it while he was talking to me, but I couldn't tell you what I got afterwards. It was you know, pretty complex. But if you're interested, there's a guy named Phil Callahan, and he was the major cutting-edge researcher on it. And we should come to a quote here from him pretty soon, so I'll, I'll leave him for that. But my friend John Nielsen actually had to travel around the state. He's got a meter, and this is the most paramagnetic rock he ever found. It's basalt. It's not the granite that we have around here. And it's very, very paramagnetic. Um, and we got a bunch of it, and actually, he said he can get me more. So if somebody wants to try it, so what do you, do with it? you use it as a soil amendment. No. Is that a rock that we use? I'm sorry, what? Is that the rock dust? It is rock dust, yeah. But it's not the rock dust that we locally get, you know? And it's different in that it's highly magnetic, you know? And in a minute, we'll see what Phil Callahan thought that accomplished. If anybody wants to play with it, I just talked to my friend who got this for me. He said he'd get me more. We'd like to see somebody learn it. I thought maybe I'd get him to start selling it. He's not going to. We don't want to be in business, but we'd probably sell it for about 75 cents a pound if anybody wants to try it. Um, and we totally got sold on it this spring. We had Dan Kitteridge here. Do people know about him? Anybody seen the video that we have about that? Um, we had Dan Kitteridge here. And he's all about getting the, the minerals to the soil so you get the nutrients back out of the plants. And so he was talking rock dust. Jeremy, my coworker, attended the workshop and then was planting squash through a shovel full of not this paramagnetic rock, but another paramagnetic rock that wasn't quite as paramagnetic, but still very paramagnetic into each squash hole. And the squash, you know how squash, when they get big, kind of fall over, even though they're, they're bush squash? 
and kind of run. I mean, that's a good squ healthy squash when it does that, you know. These didn't fall over. They stood straight up. They finally fell over towards the very end, but they were like that tall. You have a question? What, what does it attract? Um, okay, it's not about attracting. It's you'll see in a moment. It's about it's about energy. That actually is the most amending we're doing these days. Is minerals. We're using less and less fertilizer. You know, we used to have like, and there's still a bag of fish meal down there, which. Once I looked close, we shouldn't have even been using it. It had a nasty preservative in it, but we didn't know. We bought it from a place that we thought wouldn't sell us anything like that. And feather meal, when you, when you read about it and think about it, the chickens are getting fed heavy, heavy metals to kill the coccidia. They're getting fed copper. And what do all animals do? And what do plants do with heavy metals? Shed them. Where do the, where do the metals go? They go to our hair. They go to our fingernails. You know, they go where it's not going to stay in the body. They try and get it out some way. So that feather meal, of course, is going to have real high concentrations of heavy metals in it. You know, and there's all these reasons that way not to use um, those amendments. But the big one is the plants don't want that much nitrogen. They don't want it that way. They want the nitrogen to come from the life cycle of the full soil food web. That's the nitrogen that's good for them. It's like, yeah, we can get lots of calories from McDonald's, but not necessarily good for us. You know. And I'm not going to say that using nitrogen is like eating McDonald's, but it's not as good as getting it from the soil food web. So we now use one nitrogen source in our, like, we basically, if, we, if we're planting, we'll just open up a thin strip where we're planting and not till. And we'll amend it with a lot of minerals, rock dust, azomite. We might even start using this stuff called C90, which is basically dried seawater or salt. All sources, and we also use seaweed, all sources of minerals and then a small amount of alfalfa meal. Organic alfalfa meal, right? Because if you want to stay away from GMOs, you can't buy regular alfalfa meal anymore. Now it's GMO alfalfa. And of course, it's also got a preservative in it. But organic alfalfa meal, and actually it's not cheap, but we don't use very much. And the main reason we use it is the sugars in the alfalfa, the food to get the microbes going, to attract the microbes, to get them going, to get them using the minerals. You know, it's not really, we don't really care about the nitrogen in the plants. It's more about ramping up the life after we just came through and disturbed the soil. What yeah. kind of ratio would you blend it in? Like for a wheelbarrow, we might use like three quarts of alfalfa meal, you know. Three what? Three quarts. Yeah, and, and by the way, the rest isn't minerals. The bulk of it's compost, you know. Um, and actually, Dan, I think Dan Kitteridge does better ratios than we do. I'm going to... This winter, when I have time, watch that video and try and replicate his ratios. He, did, he was real good about formulas and looking at your soil test and figuring that stuff out. He covered that in, the, in those parts. So I highly recommend that for ratios. Another one that I spent a whole slide on for you is um, gypsum. How many people have heard that gypsum is good for loosening clay soil? Well, I always thought that too and, and thought I was just being derelict and not getting it or slack because I've had clay soil in lots of places that I grow. And then I used to get Acres USA. Do people know that magazine? Um, it's like this cutting edge farmer's magazine. You know, it's not, not quite as cool as um, organic gardening or something like that. But it, it's got some very cutting edge stuff and some over the top stuff too, but kind of interesting over the top stuff. Um, and in there, I just read this passing thing once that said, well, gypsum is good if you have high salt soils, like in the West where they don't get enough rain and it becomes heavy because of the salts. You know, and so one of the um, links that I just put in this slideshow, and then it'll be online for you, um, is to an Australian guy who says they, they have lots of, they call them sodic soils, high salt soils that are heavy. And for that, it works. But even there, you've got to be really careful. I mean, for 100 square feet, you're going to be using just a little bit more than two pounds. You know, so it's not heavy duty, you know. And if you think you've got heavy soil, and it's high salt, then you might want to use it for that. The reason I might use it sometimes is it doesn't have the pH changing effect that lime does, right? It's calcium sulfate. So you can get the calcium if you don't mind getting the sulfur, you know? So you, if you wanted to flee, feed blueberries calcium, let's say, that might be a good thing to give. I also use it for uh, ginseng. Right, because it would. Yeah, you want the calcium, you don't want the liming. So it's got its place, but it's probably exaggerated mm -hmm. as far as um, its usefulness for clay. You know? 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I just had a question about the nitrogen. You said you've changed so that you're using a lot less. Well, we're relying on cover crops. We're getting nitrogen, cover crops from but the, yeah. So, but you're not adding it. We're not adding. We're not buying it in. Yeah. So, what have you noticed uh, the difference in how the plants grow? We haven't noticed a difference in vigor, you know, um, and we really don't have a lot of disease and insect issues with the exception of the intractable ones. And they're as bad as ever, you know. Well, I don't know. How bad was late blight for people this year? Not bad. Well, it wasn't bad for us either, you know. We only got it in the greenhouse, ironically, where we had some heirlooms, you know. But otherwise, we didn't. Well, I mean, towards the very end, we got it. But by then, we were, you know, done with tomatoes. They were going down for other reasons besides that, you know. So I don't know that we're going to see a huge difference that way. Um, but we're not seeing a difference in production, so we were wasting that nitrogen. And it probably meant that our food wasn't as nutritious because there's going to be bigger water cells that's going to grow faster, have less minerals, you know. So, yeah. I just want to say that um, two years ago I stopped using all nitrogen except for some alfalfa and just using my cover crops and mineralization. And I've had banner years for the last two years yeah. without using, in fact, I want to sell my five gallons of fish <laughs> because I don't use it anymore. See, where we might still use fish would be in compost tea because we want that food on the leaf to feed the microbes. And then the plant would get some of that because we're covering the bottom too, and so the stomata will be open probably when we do it. You want to put the tea out when the sun's not shining so the microbes don't get killed. That means that the plant's going to get some fish. But we wouldn't be doing it to get the fish to them. It's more because we want to feed the microbes. You know, that's, if I'm using nitrogen now, it's not for the plants. It's small amounts to feed the microbial life and to ramp up the microbial life. Okay, great. Here, thank you for that, that hack. Callahan's research led him to conclude that the healthiest agricultural soils are highly paramagnetic and energetically aligned with the Earth, facilitating the flow of electromagnetic forces from the atmosphere to organic plant materials. In soils where this paramagnetic force has eroded away, adding paramagnetic rock like basalt can establish a balance necessary for healthy plant growth. So it's a magnetic property uh, it, that makes a difference, it's not the nature of the sun. I think that that's probably, it's probably both, but the interesting thing is that um, in that, I then read, after I read that thing about sodic soils in Australia, I just kind of compulsive reader, you know, and so I read the comments. And somebody from, from the United States commented them saying, well, you know, it's not really the right mix for me. I'd rather have, um, I forget, green sand because it's got the minerals I need. That's got loads of iron in it. I don't need iron. And frankly, we don't need iron here either. If you look at your soil test, our iron is usually way high, you know. But that iron is in there because that's the paramagnetic part, you know. Sure. So. So yeah, you're getting the um, iron, but you, you don't want the iron, you want the force, you know. But you are getting minerals for sure. And they make the point, in another part, they talk about the fact that that uh, paramagnetic rock also erodes much more quickly than the granite. So the minerals become available a lot more quickly. Now whether they're the minerals you want, that's another story. But they do become available. And I'm sure some of them are, of course, you know. Um, and really, if we think about how we've learned to garden, right, adding loads of organic material and loads of organic material and building it up and building it up, right, our plants are not getting nearly as many minerals. The minerals are not concentrated in that organic material. You know, they have to get down to the heavy subsoil before they start getting minerals. So I first thought about this when there's a book by, I forget the guy's name, but it's called Gardening for Hard Times. And he made the point that, you know, this intensive stuff, like you need a bigger area and the plants can spread out like they used to and get, have access to more minerals. And indeed, if you're doing these kind of heavy, heavy um, organic matter beds, you're probably not getting as many minerals in your food. And it was like, hmm, that's interesting. And then Dan Kitteridge, a lot of minds are starting to think the same way. We've got to pay attention to the minerals, you know. Um, okay, and so there are these um, links that can get you more of that. Okay, so these are the... the um, Amendments we use. This is, and I couldn't get it, that to open either. Maybe during a break I can. John Nielsen, a friend who uses our char for a business, makes a, a product called Char Grow. And this is concentrate. This is the one that he's been making for a long time. And it's all about the life. You know, it's actually a proprietary um, 
formula, so I can't talk to you about what's in it, but it definitely has a major impact. I've done trials for them, and you know, I brought trials one time to a conference, and everybody who saw those trials started buying the product, even though it was way pricey, because it just really gets the plants healthy. And then C90, I talked about that. That's basically seawater. We haven't started using that yet. I'm a little leery, and salt scares me, but you know, it's also the mineral mix, and of course, it's how diluted it is that matters, you know. Um, and then azomite, A to Z minerals, do people know that one? Yes. Yeah. Um, that also is not insignificant salt, by the way. Usually if you got fertility, you got salt. That's how it tends to go. And then gypsum back here, pelletized gypsum. And I didn't take the bag of alfalfa meal because it was falling apart, but there's a label and it does say organic, you know. And then um, thoravine, um, seaweed. You know, those are the kind of things with the rock dust. And nowadays I'm heavier on the rock dust than anything else. Indeed, when Dan Kitters was here, he kind of admitted that basically he figured you could probably get, get all of it accomplished with nothing but rock dust and cover crops. You know, it wouldn't be as quick, but you could get there with just rock dust and cover crops. You know? um, that sure is going to be a lot easier to do down the road, you know, though you know, if times get hard, those piles of waste rock dust will start to get real valuable. You know? <laughs> but right now they're pretty available. You might want to stockpile them. Okay, so test your foil, soil before you amend it. Even many composts are actually pretty high salt. So you could get in trouble real quickly if you just start throwing loads of minerals in there without paying attention to what's going on in your soil. Use deep-rooted cover crops. Use a multiplicity of, of species. And you can check out Ray Archuleta and David Brandt's presentation to get the science for that. The more we use multi-species cover crops, the better our soils get. And it's basically, does everybody understand now that the plants are not only making carbohydrates and sugars for themselves. They're actually pumping them in the soil to feed the microbial communities that protect them from diseases and that access minerals for them. So plants are like using the only perpetual motion machine, right, which is the sun, right? And they are pumping, they're putting 30 to 80 percent of what they produce below the ground. And 30 to 50 percent of that is it being exuded out into the soil, right? So they're feeding the soil incredibly. The more you have diversity, the more you have diversity of exudate feeding more diversity of life, and therefore everybody gets right the diversity, you know, despite you know some of our backward notions about it in, in human culture. Diversity is dynamic. Diversity builds and makes things more powerful, you know, and so. That's, that's standard it. soil test give you the salt? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Soluble salts. Yeah, it's on there. And it can be pretty scary. Yes? What did you say that the roots do to the minerals? Okay, the roots don't do much to the minerals. The roots can't do much with the minerals, right? But what they do is feed their buddies the microbes, and the microbes make the minerals available, particularly mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi actually exudes acids to dissolve minerals and make them available. Really major being phosphorus. Phosphorus, there's actually plenty of it in the soil in a lot of places, but it's not at all available. Plants can't access it. If they have mycorrhizae, they can access it. And if you give plants too much phosphorus, the mycorrhizae shut down because that's their job. And they're probably, I think what happens is the plants stop feeding them because they don't need them. You know, and it's, I guess, you know, there's some ways I could, I, I could go into it that the soil's capitalist. There's other, I mean, there's other ways that it's socialist, you know. Um, and this is kind of a capitalist thing there, you know. If you don't give me the, um, you know, the, the, if I don't need the phosphorus, you don't get my, my sugars, you know. Um, in other ways, the soil actually totally works, you know, for the benefit of everybody. Or not the soil, but the life of the soil. Actually, the mycorrhizae heavily do that. Um, during the break, I can give you a great example of that, but we'll never get through this if I try and do that now. So I recommend growing dynamic accumulators. Like I said, the Facilia tanacetifolia is one of those, but also things like um, borage, comfrey, all in the same family, but also um, yarrow, that bane of our, of our garden because it's also a host for um, Cercospora, which is one of the big diseases on roots. It's a, a disease on beets and carrots. Um, doc. Doc is actually a great bioaccumulator. Not burdock. Burdock is too, actually. The deep-rooted plants, right? That's why they're bioaccumulators. They're going down deep, 
accessing the minerals for themselves. When they die, those minerals are now on the, on the soil level and become available to everybody. Bur so you, not good, you right? Burdock is great. It's one, of the, it's one of the plants that we're going to talk about that you can eat. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent plant. Yeah, it's not fun when it's in flower and you're getting those burrs all over you, but you know. Okay, and then biochar. We're big on biochar here. And why biochar is so powerful in the soil is because of surface area. One gram is the equivalent of two tennis courts of surface area. And so it's kind of like a coral reef for the microbes. And the microbes, of course, have been feeding on all the minerals that are brought up by the, by, by the dynamic accumulators, been having the benefit of the mycorrhizae, which are making the minerals available, and they're getting all the sugars from the plants, from the exudates. They just need some place to live, and the char is some place for them to live. Likewise, there can be nutrients held in there. Mycorrhizae love the char, and so the char just builds on itself, and more and more life grows on it. You know? And then I talk about the gypsum, which I did when we were waiting so it's the same thing there's the name of the video that I recommend I really recommend that if you follow that it'll really help you um, if you're in any situations like if you have cloches over beds all the time for some reason or if you have a greenhouse and you don't leave the, the plastic off every few years and let there be a good amount of rain going through there and maybe water rain water through it once in a while you'll build up salts and you'll start having the same problems that they have in the West and they have in Australia. And then you might need gypsum. And the last thing to talk about is micronutrients. And this is a great example for the roots class, right? Mark Schoenbeck was here doing a wonderful workshop on cover crops and reading soil tests. Mark Schoenbeck, Soil Fertility Systems Part 2. I highly recommend that. Boy, does that guy know his cover crops. Anyways, I somehow mentioned in passing that we just couldn't get good beets. Our beets did terrible here. He said boron. The minute, the minute he put boron on his beets, he started getting big beets. I immediately did it, and immediately we got good beets. You know? yeah. So don't do it without testing. You know, I can go look at my tests and see that indeed we are low on boron. You know? And it takes hardly any. You know, it is a trace mineral, but it's critical for not just, not just beets, but it turns out celeriac too. The stems could end up getting cracks if they don't have that. Broccoli, you ever see those hollow stems? That could be two things. It could be rapid growth after dryness, or it could be boron. So pay attention to your, to your micronutrients, you know? Yeah? Um, is there a place that you recommend for soil testing um, around here? We use both the state and a &L, and then once in a while we do these really expensive, one, expensive ones at Woods End. Woods End does more about the biology. Ray Archuleta asked us to do those. So we do one every couple of years and just kind of track, you know, how, how things are changing. You know? So you said Woods End or the price of the month, and then um, the, the state and... State's free if you do it at the right time of year. Right now they're charging, but if you do it in the summer, it's free. Okay. You know, they want, they're trying to spread the business out so they're not so jammed up in the winter. And then A&L Labs. a and is pretty good. They'll talk to you. And I've had less variability. I've had some pretty crazy reports from the state, you know, and I mentioned that to Elaine Ingham. She said, well, think about it. They're all graduate students. Sometimes their minds are on other things, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Typically, how long does it take you to get your soil test back from the state? Depends on the time of year. Right now, a long time. You know? We sent ours in like six months ago and haven't heard a peep. Six months? I'd call them up. That's probably lost. Yeah. yeah. Call them up. I think you probably want to do another one, you know? I think that's gone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It. yeah. it happens. I've, I've had them lose mine, you know? Um, but given the price, I mean, <laughs> yeah. and I mean, I've enjoyed the input. People who are in that lab have come to talks and had good input, you know, so it's like. At the state? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, has everybody got what they need from that? Yes. Yeah. Quick question. You mentioned uh, a little more of an expensive place to go for soil testing. Um, can you give me an idea of what we're talking about money-wise? Oh, I think it's probably like eight or nine dollars. You, you can get different different levels. You know, you can get up to twenty or something if you get everything. You know, and you might do everything once. You know, like I think that you can pay a fair amount of money and even get heavy metals. And if I was starting out with a garden, I'd do heavy metals. What I've ever done with heavy metals, though, is um, send it into waste analysis because it's real cheap to get heavy metals done through waste analysis. You know, they're probably going to say, "Well, what are they doing this?" <laughs> but they'll test it for you. And yeah. Part of the government yeah, that's NC, NCDA. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the name of that company? A&L Labs. And then we use the Virginia branch. 
You know, they might have changed the name, but if you punch an A and L, they'll tell you the name, you know. I think they might have gotten bought and changed the name, and I don't really look at it anymore. I look at the results. I'm not looking at the name, you know. So genetics as in resistance. This is a key piece, right? If you have to deal with diseases, you know, like, example, carrots. How many people grow carrots in the summertime and like to eat them? Yeah, well, they, they get totally racked by fungal diseases. We live in a hot, humid climate, and they get hammered by Altenaria, Cecosporus, and Downy, powdery mildew. Well, I've seen less powdery mildew. It's more Altenaria and Cecospora for us. But um, they just get hammered, and even if they grow, they're not worth eating. They taste terrible, you know? Once, the, once frost comes, the sweetness comes out and masks all that flavor, and then they're okay again. They're never as good as the ones, though, that grew either in the cold and only, as it was only starting to warm up. Like if you plant them in March and harvest them by mid-May or something, those can be really good carrots, you know? Or, ideally, plant them in the summer and let them mature into the fall, you know? Those are the best. Let the frost hit them a few times, then you get that sweet, crisp carrot that is like nothing you can buy. You know? Sugar snacks, if you're going to, and so, why would I grow, grow it in the summer? And they, I say they taste so terrible. Sugar snacks and bolero both can be planted in May, and I planted a nice bed full of bolero carrots and didn't touch them till the end of September, you know, or maybe October, you know. They're, bolero's noted for storing well in the ground, actually getting better and better in flavor. Those carrots, huge and so delicious, you know. Sugar Snacks is a Nantes Imperator cross, so it's a big carrot. And if you get it in in May, or any time in the summer, it's going to get really big, and then the cold's going to get it tasting really good. So that's why, even though I wouldn't want to eat them when the disease around, disease is around, I want them to grow through the disease so that they're nice and big and ready to harvest when it gets cold. Um, okay, and then Bolero, it's got an amazing disease-resistant package. It, to me, it's the go-to disease-resistant carrot because it's not only sugar snacks is resistant to alternaria, which, by the way, is the worst one for us, you know. It's the one that doesn't, but it's also resistant to Cecospora and powdery mildew. So it just, it just cruises along. Doesn't mean, it I mean, while it's resisting, it's making the chemicals to fight the fungus that makes it taste like crap. But once it cools off, it stops making those chemicals, and then the sugars start getting developed because of the cold, and it starts tasting really wonderful. So I highly recommend Bolero. Um, okay, as far as potatoes, Kennebec is, is resistant to late blight, which is the only one I really care about, you know. Dark red Nor Norland and all blue are both listed as having some decent disease resistance. And there's a whole bunch more. I just threw a, co uh, a couple up there. And then for beets, Cercospora is the big problem. And what I left off there, so I'm going to say it now before I forget, I already alluded to it. That dock that we were talking about, not the burdock, but dock, right? People know the difference? Yeah. The dock, you ever look at it and it's got all those little red spots on it? That's the, that's the cospora. It's an alternate host for Cecospora. So if you have a lot of dock, you're going to have a lot of Cecospora. Years ago, a friend was in my CSA, and she'd been in somebody else's CSA before. She saw him one time and said, well, I love Patrick's CSA, but I love that I used to get beets from you in the summer, and he doesn't have beets in the summer. And they were like, he can't grow beets? What's wrong with him? You know? And I was at market, I saw him. I said, so do you have a lot of Cecospora on your farm? He said, what's Cecospora? I said, do you have much dock? He said, What's doc? <laughs> <That's, you know. laughs> that explains it. Yeah, if I didn't have Cecospora, I could grow a lot of beets in the summer too. But I get, I don't, I tend not to even try and grow them in the heat of the summer. But I'll grow them into the summer, and I'll start them in the summer into the fall. And the only time I grow the one I love, which is early to early wonder tall top, um, is in the early spring, so that it beats the cold, the heat, and then it's wonderful. You know, but it, it doesn't even taste that good if it gets all the heat in the summer. Unlike the carrot, it just, if the damage is enough that it's never that exciting. So I only grow, or we only grow, really, Ace and Merlin, because they're both quite resistant to Cecospora, and that lets us go. And canker, you know, I actually have not been bothered that much by canker. You know, it's a, once in a while there's a bad spot on a parsnip, I just cut it out, but I guess it is a problem for some people. And these varieties here, all, all the varieties Johnny sells. People know Johnny's Selected Seed? Anybody not know Johnny's Selected Seed? I highly recommend that catalog. In fact, 
I can give you a copy from this year if you want to take a look at it and see. They'll send you one though, you know. It's a great catalog. Um, all three of the ones they offer are canker resistant, you know. But that's, if you can get the genetic resistance, why wouldn't you, right? Now, usually that resistance means it's not the very best tasting one. And so you might, when the time is right, grow the best tasting ones. And I think the next slide addresses that. Insects cause damage to roots and vector diseases. So insects are a problem. And the big one for roots, the big one that is problematic because I love our goldenrod. I love our wild asters. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Aster yellows. Anybody ever run into aster yellows? Oh, you're all so lucky. But maybe you have and don't know it. You ever have plants that the flowers stop flowering and they just look like a bunch of leaves? And the flowers are real convoluted and there's like all kinds of convoluted look to the plant? Nope, okay, you guys are lucky. Um, maybe we don't know. Yeah, um, that's aster yellows. It's not a virus, it's a pre-virus, a plasmoid or something like that. It's, it's like this ancient thing that happened before viruses, but it's similar function. And its main host is asters. Interestingly, my farm in Silo, and I think here too, I think really the problem with us having aster yellows here is the goldenrod. Because I look at the asters, I don't see deformed flowers. I don't see these, the, the different yellowing and all that. I see it in the goldenrod. The wild aster seems to be very resistant to it. When I got problems, I had asters take down my celery one year. I mean, aster yellows take down my celery and my lettuce. The lettuce gets incredibly convoluted. Deep, if it's red, deep red colors and tastes really sweet, but you know it's not good for you. And it's like hardly anything there. It's just this little bit of convoluted, deep colored stuff. I couldn't figure out why I had it. It just suddenly showed up. But I'd been getting adventurous and I was going to grow cut flowers. And I grew a whole bunch of cut flower asters. And it didn't register with me until I went to a flower talk that, that, that fall. And the woman was talking and somebody asked her about asters. She said, I just don't grow them because I get aster yellows every time I grow them. And I was like, bingo, out with the asters. You know? <laughs> None of those fancy asters. You know? And indeed, the same farmer who um, couldn't understand why I couldn't grow beets, had a huge problem with asters, and they're a big cut flower group. And I figured I'd share the information. It's like, your asters are probably why you're having trouble with aster yellows. You know, so you might want to get them real far away. You know, but it's hard to get them far away. I actually grew celery across the street up in my yard to try and get away from the aster yellows down here. And still a couple plants got it. It wasn't nearly as bad. The aster yellows is spread by the six-spotted aster leafhopper. And it has to eat the plant with the infection, then it has to grow in it. And then I think it's a, I forget, it's, it's, it's a fair while later. Then when it takes a bite out of another plant, it's, it spreads it. So the solution is supposed to be to control the six spotted leafhopper. Good luck, you know? I mean, I hardly ever even see it, you know? My solution to that is just keep ramping up my, my farmscaping so that they never are in big numbers, I guess. But I'm also fearing that we need to knock the goldenrod way back. It's really way, way out of control this year because our ornamental bed, we were short an intern, our ornamental bed didn't get taken care of. And we let it bloom to feed the bees. But as soon as the blooms are done, it's coming out. You know? So you've got to watch out for those, those plants, particularly, I think, more the goldenrod you know, and the, the cut flower asters. And if you want to know more about those, I think the top one is a picture of the um, six-spotted leaf aster. And the second one, I think, is about the various plants that get aster yellows, and there's a bunch of them. Celery, carrots, parsnips, lettuce, a whole bunch. But for root crops, celery, and so therefore celeriac, right? And, that's, and it's hit our celeriac pretty hard a few times. I haven't seen it on carrots and parsnips yet, but it's scary to think about it, because it, it definitely, your crop is pretty much toast. You don't get rid of it. It's like a virus you know, that you don't get rid of. So it's bad news. And then the final one is actually about aster yellows. That is our garden about two years ago. And it was to show you the farmscaping. And that's a critical piece to solving the insect problems, including the aster, six-spotted aster, all the insects, loads of flowering plants. It happened to be a perfect one for this talk, though, because that's also Marshall applying compost tea. So we're getting our plants as healthy as we can. There are minerals in that tea. And we have loads of flowers to feed the beneficial insects. The beneficial insects then eat 
and put their young next to are in the pest. And you don't really, if you're, if you're using this method of pest control, you're not trying to get rid of the insects, you want them in balance. So if I'm successful with the um, leaf hopper, there'll be a few around, but not enough to wreck my crop. There'll be a little bit of aster yellows and I can live with a little bit of aster yellows. I just don't want every last celery or celeriac or carrot to get aster yellows. You know, and so that's the theory of this. And the outcome is right here. Can you see that right in there? That is a lacewing larva. And then right up here is another one. So there's two lacewing larvas. That guy right there is a parasitized by baconid wasp um, lar um, aphid. And then right there, that little bit of yellow. Can you see that little bit of yellow there by any chance? That is surface fly larva. And actually, if this was an insect talk, you'd see five more pictures of the same plant because every other beneficial insect was on that plant too. This is goldenrod that I'm talking about getting rid of, right? In the springtime, gets covered up with red aphids. And those red aphids don't much attack anything else, but there's so many of them that every predator in the world comes in and feeds on them. I mean, every predator. Even this huge um, robber fly, which is as big as a bumblebee, which would never mess with an aphid, but it'll do aphids on the cob. You know, um, and so that's just what you know. An example: you not only do you grow the flowers, but you also let food happen. You know, and my entomologist friend said to me once, "Pat, you're playing with fire when you're playing with aphids." I said, Humans have been playing with fire for a long time. We mostly do okay. You know, we just got to pay attention. You know, and I pay attention. I'm not going to let aphids build up on a crop I'm trying to get, but I might let them build up a little because usually the solution comes right in, just like here. Yeah. Uh, on my butterfly weed and uh, stuff, I get these golden aphids. Yeah. And somehow I've been told that those are actually beneficial aphids. Well, they're beneficial because they're feeding all the beneficials. Yeah. But yeah. They don't, they don't mind. They they only attack they only attack milkweed. Yeah. 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 The milkweed aphid. Yeah. It's a wonderful aphid. It's gorgeous. I have tons of great pictures of that and all kinds of beneficials, including one. This is the only time I've ever seen it. I sent it to my entomologist friend, Dr. McBug, by the way. If you want to know about bugs, just go, go online and punch in Dr. McBug. He's got a whole website full of all kinds of insect control stuff. Lots of my pictures, lots of my plant formulas. We're partners. We work on that kind of stuff a lot. Lots of his stuff too, believe me. Your garden, is your, does it matter what kind of flowers you put in? Is your particular? Well, what I've learned is grow the flowers you love because most of them work, you know? Let your plant, let your, your vegetables go to seed because they love those, like broccoli flowers, lettuce flowers, onion flowers. They love all those. All the herbs, they love those, you know. But there's, some flowers aren't that great, like snapdragons. They're kind of closed up. Nothing's much feeding on those. And the one that's a total bust, can anybody guess what it is? It is the flower that is most likely to be planted to keep bugs away. Anybody got an idea now? Yeah, they're useless. Yeah. They're utterly useless. Do you ever see bugs on them? No. no, they stink so bad nobody goes near them. The theory is that they're going to mask the smell of the plants. Have you seen bugs not coming to your garden because you have marigolds? I sure haven't. What I say is, well, maybe the ones that aren't hungry. You know, go, oh, it stinks there and I'm not hungry anyways. But, gee, it stinks, but I'm hungry. You know, <laughs> you know it's not going to happen. Anyways, the other one, and this we see all the time here, that is an imported cabbage worm. And it is dead. It has, those, those cocoons used to be inside it. They used to be little tiny larvae feeding on that worm. And now they're hatched out and they're going to hatch out and be these tiny little wasps. Tiny little wasps that fly around called baconid wasp. And not only do you need to have all the flowers, but you need to have water features. Perfect example, it's almost finished, but if you go out in the garden there, you can see a couple of really big plants with yellow flowers that are finishing up. It's called the cup plant. And it's got leaves that funnel water, dew and rain, back down to these little cups at the stem. And that's perfect for things like the Baconid wasp because they're such weak flyers that they wouldn't get far enough to get water otherwise. And they would only be by the water source. They wouldn't be in the middle of the garden. But because we have these water sources, we have more of the beneficial insects. Yeah. I missed something when you said let the vegetables go to weed. Go to seed. seed. For what do you do that? The, because the bugs, the, like, okay, this is a perfect example. Dr. McDonald 
told a story which I love to repeat in bug talks, and I'll give it to you now because to explain the question to you. Two Baconan wasps, right? Those guys there, right? Hatch out, right? And they're both females. And they both fly off, right? And one takes a right and one takes a left, right? Well, the left is to a, a, a lawn across the street with hardly any flowers, right? And the right is to our garden, right? So the one lands on a broccoli flower that's opened up and feeds on it, right? And the other one doesn't find any food. But then sooner, sooner or later, usually sooner, along comes the male and they mate because that's what it's all about, right? Okay, so the one that's up there, no flowers, didn't get a meal, 30 eggs. And what happens when, when they all hatch out? They fly down here because there's no food up there, you know? Here, 300 eggs. And what do they do? They stay here because there's food, you know? So that broccoli going to fly, and they just, they, you know, very often flowers that are really very popular with predators are, these are actually parasitoids because they kill their host, right? Um, but a, par a parasite won't kill the host. It just kind of lives in it and takes advantage of it. But these guys kill them, right? Very often the flowers they like most are of the plants they're protecting because they're hanging around those ones. So they're used to feeding on them, you know? And they also lay their eggs in the pest. You know? So I'm still missing something. You let your broccoli, now not all of it, but you know how your broccoli's been making broccoli for a yeah. long time? Yeah. And you're done. You don't want to, the, the side shoots are too small. Right. You don't pull the, all the plants out, you leave one or two in. And then they'll go there to eat it. They'll go there to eat, take nectar and pollen from the flowers. Oh. They feed on the, they, they actually don't eat worms themselves, they feed on nectar and pollen. So you want to grow flowers to make nectar and pollen, and particularly they like the, flowers of the plants they protect. Basically because they're hanging out there so they've learned to eat it, you know? You know, if you hang out in an Italian neighborhood, you're probably gonna like Italian food. Italian. You know? Yeah, so <laughs> you're right. You like Italian food anyways. I like Italian food. All right, so that's the idea, right? And you see it, believe it, celebrate it. It is the solution, you know? And don't forget that the birds, the bats, the frogs, and the grandkids, all of life is part of your controls, right? I mean, literally, I used to pay my neighbor's kids a penny, a bean beetle, and five cents, a, a, a asparagus beetle. And they'd come over with all these bugs and I'd make this big deal about carefully counting and then just give them a dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it worked great, you know? I mean, you know, especially on asparagus beetles, which until I got my biocontrol in place, they were really hammering it, you know? And since they were worth a nickel, they looked really hard for those. And I made it five times as valuable, you know? So all of life can work towards control. <laughs>